Welcome to a talk by Jedi Jaringan Ecology Dan Iklim, Network for Climate and Ecology. Tonight, I'm going to talk about Penang Tolak Tambak, which is the movement against the Penang South Reclamation. Why we think that Penang South Reclamation will be actually a tragedy for Penang. And uh, of course, we use this clickbait title, which is what will happen, you know, what, what happens next to Penang. Because I think many people do not understand what the Penang South Reclamation is about. And we need to know because it's going to have a very direct impact on our future. Let me, sh let me start with this uh, PowerPoint. Okay. I think the people who are actually criticizing uh, those of us who object to, to Penang South Reclamation actually don't know very much about Penang South Reclamation. I don't think they really know what the project is about. So I have met people who said, you know, why are you, you know, just going against this project? Why are you protesting and all that? And then I asked them, okay, what do you know about the project? And I find that actually they know very little. So that's why I think there are people who, you know, they are defending the project, but without realizing what it's all about. So that's why I think, I mean, it's good if people who are our detractors, you know, who are actually uh, not agreeing with us, also watch this because they need to know. They need to know what this project is all about. And they need to, um, they need to then understand why they, they need to think, do they really want to defend this project when they don't really understand it? Okay, and uh, um, let's see. Uh, okay, let me start. Okay. So this island reclamation, where does this idea come from? Island reclamation actually is uh, an idea that the, the new iteration actually comes from Dubai because Dubai reclaimed the Palm Islands and they were hoping for, you know, a lot of... Uh, can, you, can you see my screen? Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. They were, so they were hoping for, for a lot of investment from all over the world. And uh, so they created this kind of resort, okay, for the rich, for the famous, you know, they got some David Beckham and all that to come and launch this. And then uh, because it was like making a lot of money initially, okay, because it was boom years, you know, it was, there was an economic boom. So after 2008, uh, the econo economic boom ended. In fact, the, the, the whole world finance crash then what happened? Well, it still tried to carry on, but actually a lot of the reclaimed islands then just stopped halfway, okay? Some of the projects stopped halfway and uh, the, the, the islands are still empty. Nobody, you know, not, not many people or hardly anybody is staying there. So it's actually, it's a real estate disaster besides being an environmental disaster. And yet you, you still find people copying this idea. Why? Because I think it's the way that money is moved around the world that uh, some people have money to invest somewhere and they need to put it somewhere. Uh, some people need to wash the money also, so they, they need to invest in fixed assets. So you find that this uh, idea has also been replicated in Johor and you see those high rises, very, very high, very, very dense. And do, do you think that it's ever going to be, you know, lived in? Uh, I mean, people may, may go there and spend a holiday there, but are they going to actually live there? Because there's no real economy, there's no real jobs. Um, and then you have also in Jakarta, Telok Jakarta, you have Telok Benua Bali, and you have um, also in Philippines. Philippines also, there is some similar type of reclamation. So these are the people who develop resorts, uh, leisure resorts, uh, casinos, you know, um, I mean, it's the same kind of idea that, you know, you create a fantasy island just for leisure. Okay, so it's not just in Penang that's happening, it's actually happening all over Malaysia. So you see Tanjung Aru, there is a resort, uh, a, a, a kind of a reclamation island planned. Langkawi, they just announced, but uh, Johor, there are also reclamations plan and at that time 
um, you know, one polit particular political party was very much against it. But I don't know in Penang why they're for it because it's an uncontrolled development, as it says here. And in Malacca, you see the, the Portuguese uh, Eurasian, uh, Portuguese Eurasian uh, fishermen have actually staged a mock funeral to protest um, this uh, Malacca gateway, which is also Tergendala. You know, it's halfway done and not finished, but the seas have been destroyed. The fishing grounds have been destroyed. Uh, a lot of money has been sunk in and some people have already made money. Maybe the people who's, who sold the sand or who, you know, uh, got the contract and then they flip the project and, you know, and then that's it. Lah. So these, these kind of land, uh, unrealistic land reclamation is, uh, uh, is kind of more, more like quick, somebody makes a quick buck and then leaves a, a big mess for everyone else. Um, and in the National Physical Plan, actually, it says that no reclamation is, um, they advise against reclamation, except when it's like very essential kind of port works or very essential infrastructure works. But this is not essential infrastructure. Okay, so what is the Penang South Reclamation? Um, again, we don't know so much about it, except that uh, some... Uh, in April 2019, it was presented to the National Physical Planning Committee or the Majlis Perancangan Physical Negara. And then what we know is from the Lapan Blas Nasihat or 18 advice, advice pieces of advice that is going to be three islands, 4,500 acres or 1,821 hectares. And then the land use is going to be industry. Uh, that means island A is mainly industry. Island B is mainly housing, condos. And island C is mainly uh, tourism and recreation. The population projection is 446,300. Uh, 4, 446,300. And the current uh, population of Penang Island is 800,000. So this population projection is like within 10 years or 15 years, you're going to get 400,000 people in the three islands. So at first it says six, 15 years. Now they say maybe 30 years. And then uh, you will require 189.1 million meters of sand, cubic meters. And now because they say they want to raise the level, it will require more than that. And then uh, how many uh, tons of carbon dioxide will be released every year, annually, uh, 3.2 million tons. Okay, all these facts are from uh, the submission to National Physical Planning Committee. Okay, so when it's presented, it's like it's an MTC, okay? But we can see that from the EIA itself, it says this is Kawasan Ketam, uh, crab area, Kawasan Udang is a prawn area, and Kawasan Ikan is a fish area. So um, this... See, it's not empty. It's actually the fishing grounds for the community that lives in the south of the island. Okay. Now, the PTMP, Penang, south, uh, Penang Transport Master Plan and Penang South Recreation Plan is a 40-year plan which was created by, you know, it's a 2015 to 2065. Is that 40 years? 50 years, sorry. 50-year plan was created by three developers without any public participation and it's shrouded in secrecy. So when we insisted on looking at the plans uh, in 2016, we were said we were told no copies, no cameras, no handphones, and these are the detailed plans. And then later on, when we said, can you you know publish the plans online? We asked the government, and then they said, oh, it's already changed, so no need to publish online. But you know some aspects are still the same. Or some details have changed, and there's also a kind of uh, culture of secrecy that, in that, that the government officers themselves do not dare to talk about the plan or the flaws of the plan. So we call this an elephant in the room syndrome. So we have to break the silence. We have to start talking about it because it's really going to affect our future. What is the justification for putting South Reclamation? Again, you know, there's a lack of documentation that is, uh, except once in a while you see what the politicians announced. But in the environmental impact assessment of 2017, it says uh, the Penang South Reclamation is actually to pay for the Penang Transport Master Plan. 
okay? And the, the EIA was actually uh, rejected in 2017 because of uh, the, the, the fishermen, you know, went to appeal to the minister at that time, and then the, the EIA was rejected. Then in 2019, the EIA was again exhibited, and this time it says to generate economic growth for Penang. So basically, it has been decoupled from the Penang Transport Master Plan. So if you think it has anything to do with the Penang Transport Master Plan, it doesn't say so in the EIA, in the latest EIA. Okay, and the other uh, problem that we have with the EIA is that it has no cost-benefit analysis. So who is actually gaining from the, uh, from the Penang self-reclamation and who will lose? So this is an, a very essential function of any EIA is actually to explain the cost and benefit. What is the cost and what is the benefit? Who gains and who loses? And it, there is no cost-benefit analysis. Have you ever heard of a cost-benefit analysis for the Penang self-reclamation? Well, neither have I. It may be, you know, just kind of explain off the cuff in a press conference or something. Have you seen a document? No. In fact, have you seen any real documents on the Penang self-reclamation, except for the EIA? No. Actually, you know, hardly anyone has seen it. Maybe only very, very few people, uh, the, the top uh, government officers and the top uh, businessmen, I don't know. Maybe, but members of the public, we don't, we don't get access to this kind of information. So the Penang, what, what is uh, curious is that this is a private developer's plan and then it was really nearly incorporated into the Penang structure plan. And the Penang structure plan, you know, it's very complex and it gives, um, it, it, it actually structure plan, uh, according to the Town and Country Planning Act, must be done from the bottom up. That means you talk to everybody in the locality and then you come up you come up with a tentative plan and so forth, and then after that, it's integrated into a structure plan. But in this case, the structure plan was very, very top down. And uh, from the responses, I mean, we responded to the planning, to the structure plan, and we didn't get any uh, reply. You know, there's no detailed explanation why something, you know, to the questions that we asked. Okay, so uh, there are many uh, things that we, we, uh, find questionable in the Penang structure plan, but one of them uh, is something that they share with the Penang self reclamation uh, documents, and that is the population figures. And the population figures do not correspond to the Department of Statistics. So, who should we believe? Should we believe the Department of Statistics, or should we believe um, should we believe the Penang? Penang structure plan projections and the Penang self reclamation projections. So, in 2020, uh, Department of Statistics tells us that we have 1,000, uh, 1 million, 800 people, 1 million, 1 1.8 million people, 1.8 million people. And then, um, you know, the PTMP says we have 2 million people. And then the uh, structure plan because the ptmp plan is from 2015 right so the the structure plan which is more recent says that we have 205 to uh 205 million people and the projections um the department of statistics says that we're going to have 1.98 million whereas the ptmp and the structure plan says that we're going to have uh 2.45 million. So where are the 400 million people going to come? Uh, 400,000 people going to come from? Where where are the 400,000 people going to come from? And you know there was even news saying that uh, Penang people are not reproducing as fast as uh, you know we're not making enough babies in Penang to actually you know reach two million two million people in 2030. But uh, Penang structure plan can say something totally different. So. Who, who should we believe? Okay. Okay. So I just need to show you this because most people don't realize how this whole Penang self reclamation came about. Actually, it started with a plan to improve Penang's public transport. And I'll show you a very short video. Uh, okay.
Hi, this is Chris Gosto, we name Transport Master Plan, BTMP. Let's start. Many people think uh, that this BTMP is an idea by our state government. No! It was an idea proposed by the Penang Civil Society in 2009 to the state government and they said, Okay, no problem, we will do it. In response to that request, the Penang state government then engaged health group, a transport consultancy to produce a blueprint for Penang Transport Master Plan. But a month before the health group was appointed off, the Penang state government signed an MOU with the Beijing Urban Construction Group. This MOU states that the construction company from China will build three highways and one undersea tunnel which will cost RM 6.3 billion. But wait, don't you think we should wait for the health crew to produce the blueprint first? They are the expert after all. So after about two years of detailed study with the participation of various parties, the health crew blueprint was completed and was adopted as the state's transport master plan. It's not free, huh? Our state government paid health crew RM 3.2 million for this. After that, the state government advertised for a project delivery partner, ADP, to manage this transport master plan based on the health crew's blueprint. Six proposals received, an SRS consortium board to bid, but with a different proposal which came out of nowhere. Who is this SRS, you may ask? It consists of three companies, Gamuda, Infrastructure Property Company, Ideal, Penang Developer, Law Boy Yen Holdings, Penang Property Company. Ever since the former, the state government had went around Penang and talked to people about SRS proposal to the public. But what happened to the original health crew blueprint? Health crew blueprint uh, shows a better integrated public transport system while SRS introduced a very complicated one. It has a clear strategy to reduce our traffic problem by improving connectivity, while SRS proposed more highways in our state. A comprehensive transport master plan will sit in health group blueprint, but SRS1 is in big chunks and disconnected. We need to stick to the idea of moving people, not cars. It seems like SRS1 to propose the opposite. So now that you know a little bit about the transport master plan problems already, go and ask your local councillor, your ADU and your MP. Ask them why does the SRS proposal deviate so much from a health crew's blueprint. Okay. So... You see what happened is that in 2013, this idea, the health crew plan to improve public transport, uh, which is a $27 billion plan, okay, so it's a $27 billion ringgit plan. And uh, why 27? Actually, 10, 10 billion is the public transport projects, and the others are something like, you know, to uh, realign certain roads, improve the roundabouts and things like that, improve junctions and so forth. So actually, that the other 17 billion is uh, works which are planned, you know, for public works and MPP anyway, but MPSP as well. Uh, and some some uh, minor road works, but the main component is actually 10 billion for the public transport. And then, uh, of course, the question how to pay for it. So it was proposed that in 2015, the, the new plan came out. It says that, oh, we will pay for, pay for it with uh, Penang South Reclamation. So in 2015, 2016, suddenly it become 46 billion. And the public transport component is like, cannot find, you know, very hard to find. Oh, it's one mega project, the LRT. Okay, one LRT mega project, which was, I think, 8 billion, and then now it's 9 billion, something like that. And then PSR, Penang South Reclamation, was actually proposed to pay for it. Then after that, eh, what happened to the no more, no more public transport, no, not even any mention of the public transport. Actually, it becomes uh, 17, uh, this 46 billion, but supposed to bring in 70 billion. So the mega projects for PSR and PTMP. 
So the 46 billion, I think does it include the cost of reclamation and the top site development. So, you know, all, all sorts of figures are bandied around, but we want to see the documents. Where are the documents? Can the public scrutinize the documents? And then we also found out that there was some proposal to apply for Asian Development Bank, which uh, nobody knew about until later on. So what else? What else don't we know about? Okay. So now I want to give you some reasons. Actually, I have so many reasons. I can think of so many reasons, but these are just some of the reasons why um, it will be very unfortunate for Penang if the Penang South Reclamation goes ahead. Okay. Um, and uh, actually, when you hear it from the, the fishermen themselves, okay, this is one of the posts. It says, pretty to look at, but will potentially destroy the treasure which God has given since our ancestors' times. So these are the local people. You know, inilah, indah di mata, namun baka meleniapkan kazana yang Allah anugerahkan sejak dari datuk nenek kami lagi. Apa nasib nelayan? What is the fisherman's fate? Betul-betul kena laman nelayan mencari rezeki. It directly impacts the fishing grounds where we fishermen eat a living. Okay, and then, okay, so the first uh, reason is that, of course, PSR reclamation and pollution will affect the livelihoods of 5,000 Penang fishermen. So I didn't come up with this figure of 5,000. Uh, 5, it is actually, um, this figure comes from, I think it's 4,900 something, comes from the Minister of Agriculture in 2019. And there were many protests. In December 2015, 1,000 pirate fishermen protested and when the first AIA was displayed and they managed to lobby, you know, so that the EIA was not approved. And then in January, again, they protested against um, the STP Sri Tanjung Pinang 2, as well as BSR. And then on after the second EIA was approved, a uh, uh, few hundred fishermen actually went to parliament to make their voices heard in KL. Because in Penang, no need to, you know, whatever you say, they will just take a, you know, they were just like, uh, muffle it, muffle it. It doesn't go out of the bubble. But this time it went to KL and many people in KL were, were very, in the Klang Valley, were very surprised that, you know, how can the Penang government do such a thing? So on 4th of November, that was the last protest we had, where 1,000 fishermen plus activists and with dozens of boats protested during the Penang State Assembly. Okay, so because, why, why, it will make us cry because pollution will affect the migration routes for fresh uh, the, for the for the prawns with the prawn migration routes right and these are the prawns that we eat and again this comes from minister of agriculture and in fact the a condition of the minister of agriculture is that you have to conduct these two studies until until now i don't think i've heard of the two studies being that being conducted la. and then uh uh, just to give uh, the the what was said in Parliament, uh, says in total the Penang South Reclamation, this is from the Minister of Agriculture, the project will affect 4,909 fishermen on the island, which of which 1,422 comprises the traditional fishermen of Zone A. It is estimated that 51,184 metric tons worth 595 million a year in marine fishery landings in Penang will be affected by per permanent destruction. This PSR project will also affect 511 aquaculture or marine fisheries with a production of 45,742 metric tons worth 1.67 billion a year. So not just the fishermen of Zone A, but also the fish farms. So definitely our seafood prices will go up. Okay, the fresh wild prawns, uh, the, the wild caught prawns, uh, you can forget about it because that is really the main area for for prawns. That the Telok Kumar uh, Bay is actually the main area for catching prawns in the whole of Penang waters. Okay, and so maybe you can take uh, the antibiotic cocktails, right, of um, the the shrimp, the fish fish farm shrimp. Uh, so we don't know where these uh, shrimps are coming from, but uh, some Malaysian shrimps are actually banned by US food regulators because of illegal antibiotics use. So we hope that the ones that you consume next will not be the ones tainted with uh, illegal antibiotics. 
And then, of course, when food prices go up, you know, now this fish and prawn, it is protein for the B40. It is, uh, you know, the, the machi who buy uh, cheap, you know, uh, prawn and fish from the fishermen. Maybe not the, you know, they, they buy the, the, maybe not the high-end ones, but then they, they, you know, they sell nasi lama or they sell uh, whatever economy rice and they feed it to the family. So, so you know, B40 families are actually living on this protein. And what's going to happen when all these prices go up? How is it going to affect the social resilience in Penang, especially during the COVID pandemic? And of course, the pollution will doom our turtles, dolphins, and marine biodiversity. So there are five turtle nesting sites in the south of the island. And um, this uh, the, one of them is the Olive Ridley, which is endangered. Uh, the, and then the other one is the Green Turtle. So both are, uh, both are endangered. I think one is vulnerable. So um, you have also corals, which are going to be affected. And dolphins, and you know, people are so amazed that we still have dolphins going around the island near the Penang Bridge, and you know, uh, you, you see also, you know, we have different sorts of dolphins, dolphins and porpoise, and because of the kind of uh, development that we have, we are also have dead dolphins. Dolphins are washed up, you know, uh, on the beach, and it's it's really sad. I mean, that would really make us cry, you know, that that we see this. Uh, this kind of biodiversity and, and precious marine life being threatened. And there is a petition, if you want to sign it, it's under Rainforest Rescue, uh, Save Malaysia's Turtles. We already have almost 250,000 supporters. Please go and sign that petition. And, okay, the Department of Environment Director General approved the EIA on his last day of work. Okay, that's, uh, I think, subject for another webinar. But despite saying that the PSR would cause permanent and residual impact on mudflat ecosystems, fishing ground, turtle landing areas, and some coral reefs in Pulau Rimau, and it would affect fishery resources, fisheries, and national food supply. And this is the actual wording, you know, and the letter. So uh, there, there is a source, you know, so we always um, back up what we say. I mean, we take it from the authorities themselves. Okay, and uh, of course, we're going to lose our fishing villages. If you look at this old map, uh, it's about 200-year-old map of Penang, you can see that Penang had so many fishing villages. And one by one, they have been extinguished by development. Um, and the ones in Tangjun Tokong also, you know, badly affected by the reclamation there. And uh, we still have very, very nice uh, fishing villages in, in the south. In Teluk Kumbar. Uh, and these people, they are indigenous, you know, they've been there since, you know, long before many other people arrived. And I feel that it's just so wrong to displace them, okay? Um, you know, I feel that it's really, really wrong. And and I don't know why, you know, some some people may not share my, my feeling. Okay, the local population of Penang Island South, okay, many of them will be displaced. And as you can guess, some of them are even on temporary occupation license. So once you have a lot of development in these places, many of them will be evicted. Uh, I think some have already received eviction notice. And that's why then they just keep quiet, okay? But these are the four Pengkalan or jetties, uh, Gertak Sanggol, uh, and then Telok Kumbar, Sungai Batu, and Permatang Damar Laut, uh, of which those in Telok Kumbar and Sungai Batu are the ones who are um, very strongly against because they are full-time fishermen. Whereas in Permatang Damaran Laut, may, maybe some of them are part-time fishermen or some of them are on TOL land. So they feel a bit, uh, you know, they don't feel like they can oppose it so strongly. And I, I pity them. I hope that they will actually speak up because they also have a lot to lose. And the ones in Gertat Sangol, uh, maybe they already, um, some of them have uh, other sources of income, let's say. You know, but you know that, for example, the hatcheries, okay? Hatcheries are also taking the brackish water from the sea. So it's not just that uh, the, the fishing, the people who are fishermen will be affected, but all the fish nurseries 
seafood nurse, seafood nurseries like uh, small shellfish and all that nurseries will also be affected. So this is called Kawasan Selatan of Penang Island South. Okay, and, and you know you notice that the airport is just here. Okay. Okay, so this is a picture of Bombay. So what you will have is you will have a, a kind of a situation of glaring inequality if you have all these like multi-million dollar condos on the islands and then you have you know fishing villages on the other side is this the kind of Penang that we want then uh, PSR threatens to dramatically change the demographics of of the south okay I don't know this is from Wikipedia Telok Kumbar I mean I don't know which area they de define as Telok Kumbar but it has a population of 1,000 and 84 people in 2010. So let's say now it has a population of 3,000 people or 5,000 people. But um, I don't know why this government wants to, is very keen to put the biggest uh, foreign workers dormitory in the Lok Kumba. And I've been to that place. It's a beautiful bay, you know, and and uh, foreign workers, you know, I, I agree that they should have proper housing and all that. But if you put a very high concentration in the south, uh, and this looks like you know it could be thirty thousand in Tokumba, maybe another uh, ten thousand in Pematang Damaralau. There's already nine thousand in Batumang, so you're going to just overwhelm the local people. They're just going to be completely overwhelmed. Um, and you know the foreign workers' dorms are such that there's eighteen people to one unit sharing i don't know how many bathrooms one bathroom or two bathrooms or three bathrooms i'm not sure but you know it's one unit or one, like one apartment 18 people and you have seen because of COVID, what sort of situation that leads to and in fact um uh there are we we, we know that actually like in a pandemic these places are very uh, vulnerable to you know uh local what transmission and and uh if you look at the COVID statistics and you see cluster bring in, that's actually a foreign workers dormitory. And that's why cluster bring in, there's always uh, some, some statistics there. Lah. Okay, so this was a case where because the foreign workers, could, you know, because of COVID, so they were not allowed to go out. So they had a very short strike, lah, strike, uh, like, like uh, but anyway, the thing was, I don't know, resolved or they were told to, behave themselves or whatever it was but you know things can get explosive and um, you know actually uh, so we we don't want something like that to happen in a place where you have only like less than 5,000 people you know, kampong. and uh, uh, this the words go off a bit okay Telok Kumba roads will be overtaken by factory buses this is Batumang Road which is quite broad you know how narrow the Telok Kumba roads are and these poor workers, they have to uh, commute because they actually are not working there. You know, they should be working. They should be staying relatively close to the factories where they're staying. They can just, let's say, walk there, for example. But instead, they're all uh, shepherded into Baskilang. And um, so they're, they're paid to work for 12 hours. But actually, there are some of them are even traveling for seven hours. So if they're in... Telok Kumba, Getak Sanggol is actually at the border of Getak Sanggol. Uh, it's a Telok Kumba, Getak Sanggol border, right? They will be spending 19, 20 hours just going to work because there are no factories there, okay? The factories are all a few hours away. So this is the kind of situation. And, and then local residents also, they cannot turn right, turn left because the whole road will be clogged up with uh, bus pekerja. Okay, and... You may not have thought of this, but actually we don't have very much water. If we uh, have a few have a dry season, that's it. We have to there will be disruption. We'll just be like Selangor. We have to ration water. Right now, PBA still tries not to ration water. Okay, you look at PBA, it says population 1.7 uh, 1.7 million. So I don't know. Even PBA doesn't agree with uh the PTMP statistics because this is uh I just said this today. PBA says that we have 1.7 million people, okay, and how many consumers and so forth. And then it it gives you this picture when you open PBA website. It says every time then 74.7 percent. So it's gone up a bit from in the last few days we had rain, thank goodness. 
and then Tlok Bahang Dam 56% and Meng Kuang Dam 94.6 but Meng Kuang Dam is more like a retention dam. The water source is Ulumuda. As you know, there are issues in Ulumuda because of logging. There are plans to uh, mine uh, rare earth and and then there's also drought and then there are also um, a lot of the water is going to irrigation and there's a dispute between Penang and Kedah and Penang is trying to get water from Perak but this is all not resolved. So can you imagine that you will have to share your water with another 400,000 people in the next 10 years? Do you want to do that? I mean, it's a very, very uh, risky situation. Not only households will be affected, I mean, industries, if they are affected by water shortage a few times, they don't want to be there because, you know, uh, some of them actually need a lot of water for their processes. Okay, and you see that in Gurney Drive and Tanjung Tokong, it's still a mess, okay? There, nothing is completed. It was supposed to be completed. You know, they keep postponing the date. And from the first Tanjung Tokong reclamation, I don't see, I mean, can we ask for a post-mortem? Actually, what happened? You know, so you have what, when you have a reclamation, actually, uh, there is modeling, right? Where it will be silted, where it will be eroded and so forth. But were the model, is the modeling correct? Do we know whether the modeling was correct? And do we know if the modeling in future will be correct? Because usually modeling doesn't take into account uh, the neap tide, the high tide, low tide, and the, the monsoons and the tsunami. Nobody anticipated a tsunami. So, you know, um, we should actually learn from the past reclamation. Do you see anyone you know, trying to do uh, some uh, uh, some post-mortem, trying to understand, okay, what happened with the past reclamation. But, you know, who knows what happened? The fishermen know. And the fishermen said, please learn a lesson from us. So these are the fishermen of Tanjung Tokong. They were promised uh, some things and um, and they were kind of like, uh, how, how they were compensated. They were invited to Hari Raya open house and then they were asked to sign this and they said here's 15,000 and uh, the, the crew even got, got even less and then and then they asked for, I don't know, I think a jetty and you know a few things are infrastructure. So uh, um, some of these promises are still not being fulfilled. So they're, they're telling the fishermen in the south, please learn, please take a lesson from us. Don't be like us because these fishermen are now cannot earn a living. They cannot earn a living from fishing the way that they used to. Some of them are doing two or three jobs. And some of them are very depressed because they, you know, uh, cannot support the family like the way they used to. So uh, let's try and have uh, some honest appraisal of what happened in the in the north. And, uh, you know, and, and Gurney Wharf, when the land is reclaimed, who is whose land? Have you ever seen a plan? Who is getting what, which land? Which one is public land? You know, we have only seen like conceptual plan, but not and no detailed plan. So nobody knows what's happening with Gurney Wall. Am I right or am I wrong? Please show me. Okay, please show me if you have a detailed plan of Gurney Drive. Please show me. Okay, and then uh, oh yeah, and of course with uh, 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 Gurney Gurney Wharf reclamation and the tunnel and three highways, the whole zenith thing. There has been several. Uh, MACC investigations. Okay, you can just Google uh, MACC Penang Tunnel and you will find all sorts of, you know, investigations. So, um, we would appreciate more information. Okay, so we think that, I think anyway, that the Penang State Government is taking a huge risk on behalf of future Penangites, present and future Penangites. The developers are not taking any risk because they will own, earn a fee of between 5 and 5.7% 5 of the 46 billion uh, ringgit development costs. That means the, the, um, the, the, the state government is bearing all the risk. So if the state government, you know, has started a project halfway and there's a bank loan, you know, the state government has to pay, which means we have to pay. Eventually, I mean, somehow or other is the people's money. There's no such thing as public money. It's the people's money, right? It's all the assessments and the taxes that we're paying now, or if not now, then in the future. Um, it is all the um, the costs that, okay, if you have floods and then uh, you want the government to do something about the flooding in your area, but now they say, sorry, no money, we have to repay our bank loan, right? So you can see, okay, the income and expenditure, the surplus and the, um, and the reserves of the government. And it's like, 
1 billion, 1 billion reserves, slightly more than 1 billion, uh, 80 million surplus last year, but in 2018, it was actually deficit. So it's hovering around, you know, uh, like 1 billion, 800 to 1 billion like that. Uh, no, uh, surplus was, sorry, 80 million, 80 million surplus last year. Um, so do you think that uh, a state government with this kind of budget can undertake a 46 billion ringgit project? Okay. And any shortfall in repaying the bridging loan will be borne by taxpayers and ratepayers. So we have already heard announcements that the property owners in Penang will pay more as more in assessment. That was the last year, 2020, but because of COVID, so it has been postponed. And But you, you can be sure that, you know, all the assessments will go up, have gone up, some gone up and some will go up. And um, of course, you know, even the chief minister says that they're going to sell state land you know, to increase revenue because we have already sold so much state land and even PDC has, you know, sold. So, uh, PDC, I, I believe now is in debt, okay? And then uh, just today, there's also another article about, is it today? Uh, prime Is prime land being sold to, developer, to, to developers, the group asked in government? So we have been asking again and again and they say, no, 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 no. And suddenly, oh, it's already been sold. Okay. And Sabrang Pry will be, uh, sorry, Penang, actually Sabrang Pry, sorry, there's one extra word that because Sabrang Pry will be sidelined yet again, okay? And although uh, our Chief Minister said in 2019 that the future of Penang lies in Sabrang Pry, but all the effort is being put in, in, the, in Penang South Reclamation. So um, how, how does the future of Penang lie in Sabrang Pry? How does it work? So, you know, you can say something and, you know, like when they want to be like Singapore and Hong Kong, but when you look at Singapore, the plants in Singapore, when they say it, then they do more or less that. Lah. You know, so you can, you know, investors have confidence because they say, okay, Singapore government says it will do that. So at least for the next 10 years, it will. And then when they have a review, they will have a strategic review and so forth. But here it's like 2019. Two years ago, says future of Penang lies in Sprung Pride, and I don't see any detailed plans for Sprung Pride. Do you see any detailed plans for Sprung Pride? Okay, so reclaimed land is vulnerable to sinking, sea level rise, and extreme climate incidents. So when you reclaim any land, the engineer will tell you the reclaimed land will sink, but they anticipate you know just by a few centimeters a year. Okay, so it's a kind of acceptable change, right? But you know, the Japanese uh, have very good engineers and even they did not anticipate, they underestimated the level of the rate of sinking for uh, Kansai Airport. And they also underestimated the sea level rise. And we are always underestimating the sinking and underestimating the sea level rise. So, um, and then we don't anticipate extreme climate incidents, which can be a typhoon, a tsunami, you know. So, is it, should we then carry such a high risk for the new islands when we actually should be um, uh, in strengthening our resilience for, for Penang, you know, Penang, uh, Penang Island and Subang Pride, the existing population, not the phantom 400,000 people from, who are going to come from don't know where, okay, and whether they're going to be local, Malaysian, we don't know, okay. So if, if um, usually all these resorts, kind of developments, they are targeting at foreign buyers. Um, and the prices are really not anything that we can afford, especially now that so many people lost their jobs or the middle class has become the new uh, B40 and B, B, B40 has become B60 and all that. So who is actually going to live on the islands? And why are we taking the risk for them? Because if anything happens, then again, you know, all the state money will go towards alleviating the problems there rather than solving the flood, flooding problems here, solving, you know, any infrastructure problems for existing Penangites, it will be diverted to the new islands for probably a foreign population, largely foreign population. Okay, and then I want to come back to pollution again because um, you see, it's not just the, not just the uh, fishermen who will be affected, but actually uh, there was a submission to the, in response to the EIA, 
about by the fish farmers in Sungai Udang, and it's a one billion ringgit industry. Of course, these are 2019. I don't have the latest figures, but at that time it was a one billion ringgit industry, and uh, they had they they were the agriculture center with the highest wholesale value in the country. High value fish: siakap, garupa, gold pomfret, trevally, snapper, red snapper, and close proximity to the urban markets, and that's why they can get a good price of the fish. So majority of Singapore's food, uh, food fish comes from Sungai Udang. And live grouper, 10% of production was expo exported to Hong Kong. This could have been disrupted by COVID. So these fish farmers say, we object because a single miscalculation, misadventure or wrongdoing while reclaiming 4,500 acres 12 kilometers from a farming zone for about 15 years will result in a major halt in the domestic fish supply from Sungai Udang. So, okay, all these people who say that, um, you know, it's okay just to, you know, why, why should we stop development for a few land? Do they know about this? Do they know that it's also going to affect the 1 million ringgit fish farming industry? And if you don't know, it's okay. You can still, you know, revise your views. You know, um, you can, you know, if you have learned anything, any, you have got any new information today, you can still think about it, rethink it, you know, it's, you don't need to like uh, dig your heels in, you know, unless you're working for the developers, lah. That is, lah. You know, otherwise you can just um, you can still revise your views, and you can, if you are if you are a Penang person or Penangite or um, Malaysian or you have the public interest at heart. Sorry, I, let me turn this off. If you have the public interest at, at heart, please revise what you think. Okay, and as we as we saw in 2019, the typhoon Lakima on the 9th of August 2019, which was not anticipated, it caused a mass fish kill, and Penang fish farm uh, fish farms lost 29 million. Well, according to one report, lah. So it affected 152 owners, uh, and 800 tons of dead fish were found, hundreds of crash pages. Um, so these are not anticipated in the EIA. They're not anticipated by the planners. And uh, we, we actually cannot anticipate because we don't know what the extreme climate scenarios are. We have not done any, um, any research. Uh, we have not uh, you know, been very transparent with all the information about what has been happening so far, the trends, you know, the pollution. How much pollution do we have? We're not being transparent about it. Because I think, you know, the, pro the problem is that there is no real intention to clean up the seas. If there's some real intention to clean up our, our environment, then there will be some sort of, okay, research, okay, how do we clean up our environment? First of all, let's not pollute some more, okay? So this impact on fisheries will likely affect national food security. And um, this is also the, the uh, information from uh, LKIM that... The, this golden triangle, Penang and Para, from Sungai Udang to uh, Tanjung Piandang, Kuala Kurau, Kuala Sepetang, down to um, Pan Pantai Pasir Panjang. So these are the fisheries that will be affected by sand mining. But we don't know because the sand mining now may be moved. They said that the sand mining will be in fact closer to Penang Island. And you know it will be much cheaper for the developer to, to mine closer to Penang Island, of course. But this golden triangle of marine aquaculture, and especially Sungai Udang, Tanjung Pianang, Kuala Kurau, but they are supplying half the marine aquaculture in Peninsular Malaysia. So these are very, very important aquaculture centers. And they will also be affected by both reclamation and sand mining. And uh, 9,000, this is again from the Minister of Agriculture, 9,000 people from uh, 9,000 Perak fishermen will be affected by sand mining of 189.1 1 uh, million meter, cubic meters and from 819.7 kilometers of seabed. So if they say something like, um, don't worry about, don't worry about uh, sea level rise, we're just going to make the islands higher. That means the area of seabed that they're going to 
mine they're going to dredge is going to be even larger than that this is 8.9 is i don't know how many times the size of penang island and why should you know uh why should we actually destroy so much environment for what i mean what is the justification i still want to know okay so this is a video of a fisherman who is chasing a, a hopper or suction dredger hopper Assalamualaikum para nelayan dan semua dan jabatan-jabatan yang berkaitan dengan laut tolong ambil tindakan buat buah kapal ni sambil dia keluar dia buang tambung minta tolong ambil tindakan kapal ni sedangkan dia seduk di dalam pinang port sambil jalan dia buang selut-selut nampak selut sak saya tujuh saya ambil gambar dekat sikit so what he, what he saying is that so this um he's saying that uh this suction hopper dredger which is uh sucking up you know sand from the seabed and it's going to supposed to uh dump the tailing somewhere else but of course sometimes they um they cut short the journey and they're dumping on the way so it's called short short dumping okay so it will pollute the seas and do you think that uh, any enforcement officers will be out there to follow the suction dredger hoppers for every trip? And how do you know whether they are dumping or they're not dumping? You see, so this fisherman caught them dumping and they are, they, and he said, you know, this is Matila, uh, Nelayan Sumur. You know, that's, uh, I mean, what's going to happen to the fishermen when this happens? They are... You know, it's dooming, it's dooming them because uh, it's polluting their seas, it's polluting their fishing grounds. So when they talk about uh, enforcement of, you know, the EIA, okay, the EMS, e Environmental Management System, you know, it's all on paper. Who is going to make sure that really all the EIA, uh, all the EMS, Environmental Man Management System, uh, all the things that the developer says they're going to do, that it's going to be monitored, that everything is going to be done as as it says so you are you leaving these fishermen to do the enforcement then they will go to the uh, marine police or the EI, the, the department of environment and they will complain and then you know they have to prove so you know this this he tried to take a video of it so um it's not if if uh, all these uh, EIAs and all that was so perfect then we wouldn't have the pollution that we have uh you know and and then we always try to improve but then the 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 reality is that the world is getting more polluted okay the climate change is getting worse you know global warming is getting worse in spite of all these paper paper that is supposed to prove that there's no pollution okay and okay reclamation leads to sedimentation and coastal erosion in unexpected places Okay, so this is because it's a different department. So the department that's responsible for this is the Drainage and Irrigation Department, the JPS. And JPS is, um, you know, for every kilometer of eroded coastline, they have to spend a lot of money, hundreds of thousands, millions, just to make sure that people's houses don't fall into the sea. Who is paying for that? The taxpayers. So it's like one hand is, you know, doing this uh, reclamation work and then the other hand has to go and pay for it another government department has to pay for it who is dredging the harbor okay when the harbor gets silted who is dredging it if, you know we are paying for it but all this is not taken into account because i mean if if uh, really we are acting in the public interest then you know people really want to find out actually is it worthwhile is there a cost benefit in analysis okay Okay, then rising sea levels means that the reclaimed islands will be a future liability very soon. Okay, you're talking about 10 years, 20 years. Okay, so uh, of course, uh, YB Jagdeep says that land reclamation can protect the island from rising waters. I don't know how. Um, it's something like, uh, I, I better ask him something about global warming as well, whether it, it contributes to global warming. But this uh, Professor Hans Dieter Evers says, uh, okay, this is what he says. This is what he predicts. Reclaimed land in Penang and Singapore will go under and revert back to sea in relatively short time. 
The ecological damage has been done. The profits have been pocketed by developers. The fishermen's livelihood has been destroyed. Huge expenses for local government and taxpayers for coastal repairs. So the taxpayers are paying for coastal repairs, okay? With the rising sea levels, these newly reclaimed areas will be flooded. Water will rush into basement parking lots and roads will become impossible. The sand on the newly created islands may be un become unstable, causing danger to high-rise buildings. So we are still talking about island reclamation. I saw one comment, I think by Joshua Wu, he said that Tokyo Bay was reclaimed in the what century? Okay, but the Kansai airport is sinking. Okay, so even with Japanese engineering. So island reclamation is the one that makes the least sense. Foreshore reclamation, like I said, in, in case of infrastructure, in very, you know, uh, limited circumstances may be justified. But island reclamation is hardly ever justified. Okay, and uh, finally, what are we teaching our children? You know, you say it's wrong to throw one straw or one a face mask into the sea, but it's okay to pollute, you know, 189 million tons of sand in the sea. First of all, by digging it up, uh, you're already causing pollution, and then by dumping it, you're causing pollution again. So is it okay to do that? So uh, this is what is experienced by the fishermen. When they throw the nets into the sea, they get uh, landat laut. Landat laut is uh, sea urchins, sea urchins. So it breaks the net, so the nets are torn. And you know, if that happens a few times, they lose so much money, they give up. And who's going to catch our seafood? I mean, they are actually doing a very a valuable function for society, you know, risking their lives for to catch our seafood. And this is a traditional way of life, uh, which can be modernized. You know, you, they can actually get your know, their GPS and whatever, you know, some uh, modern equipment to help them. But it is still uh, something that, that continues for generations and generations. And we are actually not, um, you know, respecting respecting them by, by saying that it's okay to pollute the sea on such a large scale. So uh, PSR will generate 3.2 million tons of carbon annually. I think this was based on the fact that, I mean, or the statistic uh, that every Malaysian is uh, responsible for eight tons of eight tons of carbon, I don't know, 3.2, 3 yeah. So eight tons of uh, carbon, so 400,000 people will produce 3.2 million tons. I think this is based on the 400,000 people, but actually it does not really account for the sand mining. And uh, this article just came out today, how industrial fishing, that means trawling, creates more carbon CO2 emissions than air travel. If trawling is creating that kind of emissions, what about sand mining? Don't you think that sand mining is going to create more? And I'm, I'm just waiting for the article. Actually, I have a... Uh, that is, you know, sand, sand mining is like the legal and illegal. Uh, is, is like the crisis that you've never heard of, but it's breaking, you know, the stories are breaking up. And uh, finally, you can sign the petition. You can get in touch with us and just say that you want to you know, you want to be part of the movement to stop this uh, tree island reclamation. Uh, this is the last video and it's it's in Malay, but um, there is an appeal against the next South reclamation. So Haji Zakaria is actually the the uh, Ketua unit um, head fisherman of Sungai Batu, and he filed a, uh, an appeal against the approval of the EIA. And we, I hope that all of you will support him. Uh, and the appeal will be soon. I think it was uh, may, it may be postponed, but it's still on. And um, you know, they are fighting for their livelihood. They are fighting for their livelihood and for your future. 